Mark Meadows could be the first presidential chief of staff to go to prison since H.R. Haldeman served time for his role in Watergate. Among other things, Haldeman was convicted of obstruction of justice, which isn't the same thing, but it's definitely in the same ballpark. Of course, Meadows would be the second person to be charged with contempt in the January 6th probe. The first was Steve Bannon, and he won't be on trial until July of 2022, which is a huge problem. The Republican Party is the heavy favorite to regain control of the House in November of 2022, leaving the committee very little time to wrap up its January 6th investigation before the GOP moves in and starts sweeping things under the proverbial rug. For more on the legal fight ahead, let's bring in Joyce Vance, former U.S. attorney and an NBC News legal contributor. Joyce, earlier tonight, Congressman Schiff read even more texts to and from Mark Meadows. This one sent January 3rd from somebody unknown, and really they're all from someone unknown at this point in time, describes Meadows as, quote, the tip of the spear. If you, as a prosecutor, had evidence of an alleged conspirator that described them as the tip of the spear, is that something you'd use in court? And how significant are these texts if you were building a case? Well, these characterizations of people, you know, this might be the characterization of the anonymous sender. It might be something that's supported by other evidence. This is why it's so important that Congress have access to Mark Meadows' testimony, because they're trying to sort through the, the evidence, figure out who played what role, and whether there were crimes committed. But at this stage, we're still a step back, and all Congress is doing is referring Meadows to the Justice Department for a finding as to whether he should be prosecuted on contempt charges. Contempt is, of course, a misdemeanor. It's one that carries a mandatory minimum 30-day jail sentence which is some place that presumably no former presidential chief of staff wants to go. But we're now at the point of considering the contempt, not the conspiracy. I think your point is the savvy one, Katie, because much of these pieces of evidence that we're beginning to hear point far further than, than uh, just contempt charges. But you talked about the fact that there's exposure, there's jail, there's fines. Will any of this really matter? though, if the Republicans manage to run out the clock? I mean, consider this. Steve Bannon's trial, it's scheduled for July of 2022. We both know the wheels of justice, they grind slowly, but do they really have to grind this slowly? You know, they really don't. And I was surprised when the Bannon trial, which is at bottom just a very simple case involving limited facts, was scheduled so far out. Uh, you know, there are a couple of different things going on at the same time here, and one concern that everyone seems to have is that the House and perhaps the Senate as well flipping Republican at the midterm elections. That one is still up for grabs. I understand the political trends just like everyone else, but I think perhaps the abortion issue that you were just talking with George about may alter that calculus. But something that we know for certain is that the Justice Department won't flip, no matter the outcome of the midterm elections. And whatever's already in motion at the Justice Department will be able to continue forward without regard to what's going on in Congress. So earlier tonight, Republican Congressman Scott Perry halted the debate in an effort to get some of the majority whip's comments removed from the record. Short version is they weren't, but it took a lot of time for that to be decided. I think it was almost like a 50-minute delay. Was that ultimately the point, do you suspect, to tr just throw yet another wrench into the works, to slow it all down? It seems like delay is always the point. It's always the strategy. And that was one of the lessons of the Trump era. It was that people who didn't act in good faith, people who were willing to violate the norms of democracy, if not the written rules, could often get away with it through delay. And that's something that's impressed me about the January 6th committee's operation. They seem to understand that. They seem to be going straight to the important points with a high degree of professionalism. But ultimately, this will, in some sense, be a race against the clock. And along that vein, is there any way that we can speed up this legal calendar when, in cases like Meadows and Bannon, a Republican Congress maybe takes over in 2023, disbands this January 6th committee, sweeps it all away? Is there anything that can be done to actually speed up the trials, speed up this legal process? You know, once these trials are set, it's very difficult to alter the calculus. And there can be a problem with forcing a defendant to go to trial too early. I'm actually familiar with a case where the Court of Appeals reversed a conviction because they believed that a defendant had not been given sufficient time to go through the evidence. The Bannon case seems to me to be far simpler, 
Mark Meadows' case, if the Justice Department decides to indict him, will be a little bit more complicated. And I think we'll see that similar sort of a long timeline. So, uh, you know, the, the answer here is for the prosecutors to be as persistent as the Congressional Committee seems to be. And ultimately to remember that what Congress is up to, what the House Committee is up to here, is telling the American people the truth. And we have a lot of hints so far about how that will happen. Liz Cheney has suggested that there will be a couple of weeks of testimony at some point in 2022. And last night we heard the chair of the committee say that he would not let the evidence get piecemealed out so it could be discarded as last week's news. He said, you'll hear the whole story when we're ready and we're done and we'll put it in front of the American people at that point in time. So we get a little bit of a sense of where the committee is headed. So instead of citing executive privilege, we do know that there are several people that have been citing to um, things like attorney-client privilege or, you know, they're trying to do stuff like invoke their Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. You know, does that actually have any teeth? Can they hide behind that? And does that mean their referral to the DOJ for prosecution seems to be less likely to occur if they're saying that the Fifth Amendment gives them those protections? You know, Katie, you and I have been discussing this back and forth for at least the last week, and all of this gets very complicated. It seems to me that the bottom line is that planning a coup is not part of the business of the executive branch of government. And so these attempts to assert executive privilege, I think, ultimately are doomed to fail. There may be some argument about it. There may be some areas where there's legitimate executive privilege. Those claims seem pretty dubious to me. Attorney-client privilege is a different story, and typically courts will construe it very broadly. But again, I think that there are threshold issues. Whether they prevent people, for instance, like Jeffrey Bossert Clark, the former DOJ official, who's now claiming that he was in an attorney-client relationship with the president of the United States and can't be forced to testify in front of Congress because it, he's going to have a very high threshold to establish that relationship. Maybe things have changed since I was in the Justice Department, but my obligation was to represent only DOJ, only the people. And I could not have represented an outside client, not even the president of the United States, if Barack Obama had given me a call one Saturday afternoon without jumping through a lot of hoops. And then I think it's unlikely I would have ever gotten permission. So I'm looking forward to Mr. Clark's explanation of how he was in an attorney-client relationship with the privilege. Ultimately, I think these people are headed towards cooperation. It will be in their own best interests once these claims of privilege fail. Yeah, you know, it's the, uh, it's the lawyers that are trying to claim uh, that Fifth Amendment privilege, and I think you share my sentiment that that's the most disturbing. As always, Joyce Vance, thank you for being here tonight. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of The Mehdi Hassan Show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen, and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.